In this video, we will be discussing 11th grade biology and the topic is diversity in the living world. Now that's the name of a unit and the chapter that we are about to cover is living world. So now the name of the chapter suggests that we are going to discuss something about uh, the living aspects of the subject of biology. Now you know biology is the science of living things and life processes and living forms. But what exactly do you mean by living? So there are a few uh, points that you need to know, a few characteristics of what exactly is living. The first thing is an organism needs to grow. That means if the organism is growing, that means it is living. So that's the first thing you should know, that all living organisms grow. What do you think is the second feature of any kind of living organism? You can come up with lots of them, but the biggest one is most of the living organisms reproduce. They multiply, they increase their numbers. So the next feature that is there for the living organisms is reproduction. It could be through any method, but if the organism is bringing forth new ones of its own kind, we can say that it is in fact living. Another characteristic of a living organism is metabolism. That is conversion of energy from one form to another. Or like in case of humans, we eat something and then we use that. We metabolize that into a kind of energy that we use to carry out our daily work. One more characteristic of living forms, especially those at a higher level, is cellular organization. That means all living organisms are made up of structures known as cells that are the building blocks of life. One more thing that is there in most of the living organisms is a sense of consciousness. For instance, even if you take an amoeba, how does it know that it has to eat? Right? It may feel a little hungry, you can say energy is less, but it is conscious that food is nearby. Or let's take the example of a bacteria or a virus. How do they know that they have to eat or they have to get energy to live? That is because they have their consciousness. All right. The next thing that you need to know is a term called biodiversity. Now, as the name suggests, it is made up of two things. One is bio, one is diversity. That means the number of organisms that is there on the earth. Now, do you know that the number of species that are known and described they range from about 1.7 to 1.8 million. That is the number of species that we still know about. And there are millions of other species that we don't even know. And the sad thing is that many of those species are getting extinct even before we come to know of them. So that is biodiversity. That's the number and types of organisms present on the earth. Now, we will explore new areas and new kinds of places are still being found out and as a result newer and newer organisms will be found out but the problem is with so many different species how do you identify which one is what and have you seen that kind of a species before somewhere uh, what if two um, animals of the same species get identified in two different ways well to stop all that confusion there is a concept called nomenclature now, as this name suggests, it means how to name organisms. All right, we need to standardize how do we name living organisms so that throughout the world, everyone calls that organism through that name. So basically, it's nothing but a standardized procedure for naming organisms. So that is nomenclature for you. All right, now nomenclature is possible only when we are able to identify an organism and that process is simply called identification. So let's suppose you see a bird and you try to look up what is the nomenclature. That means is that bird known or not? Uh, let's suppose you find a bird that is already there existing. That means it has already been documented before. So obviously you'll get a name for that. 
a scientific name but if that bird is being seen by you for the first time then you will have to go undergo the process of nomenclature so that a standardized name can be given to that so lots of organisms uh, are there that are keep you know they keep getting discovered day by day and we need some kind of organizations that help in naming them so two very important organizations are the ICBN which stands for International Code for Botanical Nomenclature as the name suggests it's for plants or the flora and then we have ICZN which is International Code of Zoological Nomenclature all right so uh, these kind of organizations are based on agreed principles and criteria and those criteria are mentioned in these so that the naming is done through a proper channel now lots of universally accepted principles are there now each name this is an important part each name has two components one is called the generic name the other is called a specific epithet now there are two components that is why this system of nomenclature is called the binomial nomenclature that means having two components bi stands for two so binomial nomenclature that is the method all right for example let's take the example of the commonly known fruit mango mango is scientifically known as mangifera indica and it sounds weird but both of these are two different components all right two different components of the scientific name now mangifera actually refers to the genus the generic name and indica is the epithet the specific name do you know what human beings are called we are called homo sapiens now wherever you see species mentioned you will always see that they are mentioned in italics and the other thing is the first word that means the name of the genus always starts with a capital letter and the other name it always starts with a small letter so this gives us our genus which is homo and sapiens is our specific name so very close relatives of uh, human beings for example the homo erectus for instance it belonged to the same genus but the species was different so it was called homo erectus now few things you need to know that most of these are in latin they are written in italics all right either they are latinized or they are derived from latin it does not depend how they originated the first word refers to the genus and the second component refers to the species or the specific epithet both of the words they are separately underlined if you want to underline them it has to be separate separately underlined or printed in italics the first word starts with a capital letter and the second word starts with a small letter so that is how you basically have to name now just like that we cannot keep giving different names to the different organisms how do we know whether homo is from this genus or um, how do we know indica is the name of a species there's another process that you need to know about that is called classification and that is going to be the focus of our next video which is probably going to be very long it's a very very big topic uh, that is part of biology and what is the process what is um, actually the meaning of classification it is the process by which you can group any kind of species or organism into different convenient categories based on some observable characteristics for instance we have the cat family you can even have simple household domestic cats you can even have members like the tiger and the lion now we know that they are belonging to the cat family because they all have certain common characteristics so that is what classification is all about the next thing that you need to know is how do we call the specific uh, names of the scientific uh, terms for these kinds of categories that is called taxa so taxa is nothing but the scientific term for so many categories that we have
For instance, plants, they are one taxa. Cats, they are one taxa. Mammals are one taxa. All that. So these are taxa at the different levels. And that is why the process of classification is known as taxonomy. So very, very important. That is process of classification. So I hope you're understanding because it's a very, very basic thing on which the remaining of the organization and classification will be developed. Another important thing is we just don't have to know about the organisms individually. We also have to know what is the relationship between them. So the branch of study that relates to the relationship between different organisms that means interorganismal relationships that is called systematics. All right, and you know who gave this term? That was Carolus Linnaeus, a very important person in the field of classification and taxonomy. He used a term called Systema Natura, that is obviously not from English language. So basically, we refer to it as systematics. It also considers lots of evolutionary relationships that exist between organisms. Lots of uh, categories are there. So those categories can be divided according to a hierarchy. And so we call it a taxonomic hierarchy. Different kinds of things are there. For example, at the top, we have a kingdom. Then we have a phylum. After that, we have a class, then we have order, then we have family, for example, cat family, then we have genus, and then we have species. All right, so that is how the hierarchy is followed. Now, let's start with species. Species is the fundamental unit of this classification. For example, Mango. What was the species of mango? Do you remember? It was indica. Mangifera indica. Or let's take example of humans. That was sapiens. What was the genus? In case of mango, it was mangifera. And in case of humans, it was homo. So what basically species is? Species is the most fundamental um, characteristic. After that, we have genus. For example, Panthera leo. That is the scientific name of the lion. So, Panthera is the genus and leo is the species. Next, we have family. For example, we have the cat family for all uh, the animals like cats, lions, tigers, like that. Similarly, plants have different kinds of families. For example, Solanum, Datura, they're all plot, part of, let's say, in common words, we can say the onion family or the potato family, the Solanaceae family. All these are families. Next, you come to order. Order, for example, Carnivora. Order Carnivora, order Herbivora. Um, all right, so all these are the orders. Coming to the class, for example, class Mammalia or Amphibia. All right, so these are the classes. After that, we have Phylum. For example, all the animals that have a proper spinal cord, they're called as members of the Phylum Chordata. Similarly, we have Chordata and A Chordata, the ones that do not have any cord. So that is the Phylum. And finally, we have kingdom. Usually, it's all about two kingdoms. We have the animal kingdom and we have the plant kingdom. All right, so that is something that you have to remember. You have the kingdom, then you have the phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. It's better if you remember this order. Either you can go from hair to hair or you can go from hair to hair. It's your wish, but you need to remember this order as a student of biology. Okay, let's take up a few examples that are also given in the book. For example, uh, let's take mango. Okay, so we have the phylum, we have the class, we have order, family, genus, and species. So what phylum does it belong to? It belongs to the phylum or the division angiosperm. 
So if you remember plants, you have gymnosperms and angiosperms. So this belongs to angiosperms phylum of the kingdom of plants. So I'm not writing K for kingdom because it's already known that it belongs to the plant kingdom and not the animal kingdom. What is the class? The class is dicotyledonidae. That is because it's a dicotyledonous plant. All right, what about the order? Order is sapindales. Now, you don't need to go into details why is the order sapindales, but that's just an example that I'm giving. What is the family? That is the name of the family. The genus, you might remember now, it's Mangifera, and the species name is Indica. So these two will be the only components according to the binomial system of nomenclature in the scientific name. All right. And how exactly are these things documented? There are lots of um, aids or assistance uh, given to how to classify these animals and plants into different categories. So we need a proper process for that. Lots of things are there. For example, now this is all parts of all biological aids that you have, the taxonomic aids to be precise. For instance, you can have a herbarium where, let's say, leaves or different parts of a plant are stored. They're preserved for a long time and lots of cupboards are there, lots of uh, stored specimens are there. You can even have living plants. They can be part of botanical gardens. There might be a garden nearby, so if you want to know a little bit more about a few plants, you can easily go to them. Obviously, for the extinct ones, we have the museums. You have extinct animals as well as ex extinct plants plants in the museums and then you have some kind of zoos or you can call them zoological parks where different animals are put into different environments all right lots of things are there and then you also need something like a key just like you have keys for a map you also need to have keys for an organization all right so that it can help you to identify an animal or a plant using that a key would basically give you information on all of this all of these taxa basically. So that is the usefulness of a key. So that is all in this video. Thank you so much for watching this video and I hope it was helpful. And if you want to give any kind of feedback, you can always mail us or write your feedback at perfectscores89 at gmail.com. You can visit our page, share it and like it at Facebook. And you can also visit our website for more such videos. Thank you so much for watching this video.